What's up, peers, and welcome back to the World Crypto Network here for a reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the principals and associates, as well as the funding sponsors of this great open source organization. Today, newsletter number 48 on May 29th, 2019. This week's newsletter describes a new proposed op check output share outputs hash verify opcode, covers continued discussion of Taproot and links to a video presentation about handling increasing Bitcoin transaction fees. Also included are our regular sections on BAC32 sending support, top voted Bitcoin Stack Exchange questions and answers, and notable changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Action items, none this week. News. Proposed new opcode for transaction output commitments. Jeremy Rubin proposed to the Bitcoin dev mailing list a proposal to soft fork in an object multi op check outputs hash verify opcode that allows a Bitcoin transaction to require the transaction spending it includes a certain set of outputs. This enables a restriction from a form of Bitcoin covenants, which can be used to reduce the amount of data that needs to be placed on chain in certain situations, potentially reducing costs of improving privacy in those cases. For details, please see this newsletter's special section about, uh, about the proposal. Okay, proposed transaction. Uh, no, okay, we'll, we'll finish reading the news. Uh, continued discussion about BIP Taproot and BIP Tab Script. Two comments this week from the BitDev mailing list discussion seem particular noteworthy. A final stack empty. In legacy SegWit and proposed BIP Tab Tab Script scripts, a script evaluates successfully if it contains exactly one element that is true. And here the footnote. Segwit version 0, pay to witness script hash, and the tab script proposal requires the final stack contain only a single true element in order to succeed. This is called a clean stack rule. Legacy scripts for bare outputs and pay to script hash outputs allow the stack to contain multiple items and succeed as long as the item at the top of the stack at is terminant, uh, termination is true. However, legacy transactions that do not have a clean stack will not be relayed or mined by Bitcoin's core's default mempool policy. The clean stack rule helps reduce transaction malleability as any addition or removal of transaction elements to a script sig or witness will change a transaction fee rate and for legacy transaction, its transaction ID. One element, uh, Russell O'Connor raised a point he's raised before and requested that his opportunity be taken to require tab script only evaluate successfully if it ends with an empty stack. Peter Woolley replied that this works on Miniscript, see newsletter 32, and showed that for the subset of scripts Miniscript will create, this change in semantics will at most save 0 0.25 virtual bytes per transcript. Although, that also, although the change may simplify development for anyone want writing script by hand, it's a bit risky as everyday development guides to script written to date teaches the script must terminate with a true value on the stack. Woolley summarizes, so overall, this feels like something with marginal cost, but also at most marginal benefits. Move the oddness byte. Bitcoin public keys are most naturally specified using an X-Y coordinate pair, as was done in the early days of Bitcoin with uncompressed public keys. However, because a valid public key must be on the elliptic curve, it is possible to find both valid Y coordinates, one odd, one even, for any given X coordinate given the curve formula. In compressed key format, the first byte contains a single bit to sacrifice whether the Y coordinate is odd or even, followed by 32 bytes to encode the X coordinate. The proposed BIP taproot follows this convention and uses 33 bytes to encode the taproot output key. 
This week, John Newberry suggested that we use some method to avoid placing this byte in the script hubkey. Woolley agreed that this could be useful and will attempt implementing a variation where the bit will be included as part of the taproot witness data. This will reduce the cost to create a taproot output by one virtual byte, making it the same as paid to witness script hash currently. Presentation. A return to fees. During blockchain week in New York City earlier this month, Bitcoin Optech contributor Mike Schmidt gave a presentation about Bitcoin transaction fees at Optech's first executive focused briefing. This video for his presentation is now available. Schmidt began his talk by reviewing some statistics from recent Bitcoin fee events. Both short events from the past coupled for months and longer events from January 2017 to January 2018, where the next block fee for an average transaction was consistently over $1 and even over $2. He, reminded, he reminds listeners that high fees are likely to return, which may have already happened, and that organizations that implement techniques to reduce their fees by even small percentages could save significant amounts of money for themselves or their customers if fees climb as high or higher as they did before. He then describes several techniques services can implement in order to reduce their fees, and he roughly quantifies how much improvement can be expected from each technique. This includes better fee estimation, better coin selection, payment batching using SegWit, UTXO consolidations, patient spending, replaced by fee dump bumping, child pays for parent fee bumping, and lightning as a future technique. He also notes that education plays an important role in getting users to accept an ad and adopt several of these techniques and points out that it can also help reduce user interaction costs, such as providing customer support for a stack transaction during fee events. The 30-minute presentation covers each point concisely, making it an excellent high-level overview for anyone interested in learning about the Bitcoin fee market and how to mitigate uh, except, uh, expected fee increases. Proposed Transaction Output Commitments The proposed opcode check output hash verify allows a taproot address to commit to one or more tab scripts that require the transaction spending them to include a certain set of outputs. The technique that contract protocol researchers call a covenant this primary description benefit of this proposed opcode is allowing a small transaction to be confirmed now when fees might be high and to have the transaction trustlessly guarantee that a set of people will receive their actual payments later when, fee might be, when the fees might be lower. This can make it much more economical for organizations that already implement techniques such as payment batching to handle sudden fee spikes. Before we look at the new opcodes itself, let's take a moment to look at how you might accomplish something similar using current Bitcoin transactions. Alice wants to pay a set of 10 people, but transaction fees are currently high so that she does not want to send 10 separate transactions for or even use a payment batching to send one transaction that includes a output for each of the receivers. Instead, she wants to trustlessly commit to paying them in the future without having to pay on-chain fees for 10 outputs now. So Alice asks each of the receivers for one of their public keys and creates an unsigned and unbroadcasted setup transaction that pays those keys using a 10 of 10 multi-sig script. Then she creates a child transaction that spends from that multi-sig output to the 10 outputs she originally wanted to create. We'll call this child transaction the distribution transaction. She asks all the receivers to sign this distribution transaction and she ensures each person receives everyone else's signature and she signs and broadcasts the setup transaction. And here we see the setup transaction with Alice's money paying into the 10 of 10 multi-sig uh, and Alice's change. 
uh, which is then here in the input in the distribution transaction is this 10 of 10 signature output, which then pays to Bob, to Charlie, and to all of the other peers, both the amount and the address here in the input with no change back to Alice since that change was handled in the setup transaction. When that setup transaction receives a reasonable number of confirmations, there's no way for Alice to take back her payment to the 10 receivers. As long as each of the receiver has a copy of the distributed transaction and all the other signatures, there's also no way for any receiver to cheat any other receiver out of a payment. So even though the distribution transaction that actually pays the receivers has not been broadcasted or confirmed, the payments are secured by the confirmed setup transaction. At any time, any of the receivers who want to spend their money can broadcast the distribution transaction and wait for it to confirm. This technique allows spenders and receivers to lock in a set of payments during high fees and then only distribute the actual payment when fees are lower. According to Bitcoin Core fee estimation, at the time of writing, anyone patient enough to wait a week for a transaction to confirm, like the distribution transaction above, can have significantly, can save significantly on fees. Let's look at the example above in that context to make later comparisons to Taproot more fair will assume some form of key and signature aggregation is being used, such as MUSIC, or in theory, multi-party easy DSA. See newsletter number 18 for more context. And here we have a table of individual payments, the batch payment, and the commitment now versus the distribute later. The immediate high fee of a transaction right now is 10 times 141 virtual bytes, uh, or one time for 20 virtual bytes, or one time 144, uh, 141 virtual bytes. The cost uh, of 0, 0.0 or 1.4 million Satoshis per kilo, uh, uh, kilo virtual byte uh, would be here 0 0.002 uh, or and much smaller, of course, for the batch and only a bit larger for the commitment uh, transaction. To delay the low fee, the delayed low fee transaction then is a one-time payment of 389 virtual bytes for uh, the commit now distribute later transaction. Uh, and the cost assuming this here would be 349 Satoshis. The total virtual bytes uh, would be for the individual payments the highest for the commit now and distribute later, uh, still higher and cheap or a bit cheaper, but the cheapest being the batched payment uh, since this is only one transaction. Total costs, therefore, uh, are actually highest for the individual payments, uh, second highest, though, uh, for the batched payments, uh, and even smaller for the commit now, distribute later transaction. Uh, saving compared to the previous column uh, would be nothing, of course, for the individual payments. 71% for the batch payments over the individual payments, and yet even more, 66% of this commit now, distribute later transaction compared to the batched payment transaction. So overall, commit now, distribute later, by far the cheapest alternative. And we see that this type of trustlessly uh, delaying payments can save 66% over payment batching and 90% over sending separate payments. Note that the savings could be even larger during periods of greater fee, sat fee stratification or even more than 10 receivers. So continuing to check output hash verify, the proposed soft fork would add a new opcode, op check outputs hash verify, abbreviated by its author as op COSHV with an extra S. This opcode uh, and a hash digest could be included in, in a tab leafed script, allowing it to be one of the conditions in a tab root address. When that address is spent, uh, if COSHV has, was executed, the dependent transaction would only be valid if the hash digest of its output matches the hash digest read from the script by COSHV. Comparing this to our example above, Alice would again ask each participant for their public key, such as a taproot address, uh, which we jump into the footnotes. The proposed taproot address format 
version 1 SACLIT addresses include a public key directly in the address. So anyone with a set of taproot addresses can use them to create an aggregated public key. However, some users may create taproot addresses using public keys for which no one has or can publicly generate the corresponding private key. For that reason, anyone creating aggregated pub keys should probably not assume that taproot addresses are pub keys themselves and should collect separate pub keys. Additionally, it's probably a good idea to not reuse the same pub key in more than one place within Bitcoin. We omit the extra steps of collecting pub keys in this newsletter example in order to simplify the description of COSHV. Please consider consulting with a Bitcoin expert before you implement the protocol you read above in the pages of this newsletter or anywhere else on the internet. Don't trust, verify. Similar to before, she'd receive, she'd create 10 outputs with which each paid one of the receivers, but you would need to form this into a specific distribution transaction. Instead, she just hash the 10 outputs together and use the resultant digest to create a tab leaf script contained, containing COSHV. That would be the only tab leaf in this tab root commitment. Alice could also use the participant's public key to form the taproot internal key to allow them to cooperatively spend the money without revealing the taproot script path. And here we see a, a check outputs script hash verify commitment to outputs of Charlie, Bob, and Kendra and all the other 10 individuals of this payment. We hash this into the digest and put this into the mast tree uh, with then together with Alice's money input uh, and Alice's change and the taproot internal key becomes the payment to taproot, uh, which is then uh, in the spending transaction or distribution transaction, the input executing this op uh, check outputs script hash verify uh, to verify that all the outputs created are part of this hash digest. And then all these individual outputs here need to be included in this transaction. Uh, so within Taproot, we commit to the outputs of the distribution transaction. Alice would then give each of the receivers a copy of all 10 outputs to allow each of them to verify that Alice's setup transaction, when suitably confirmed, guarantees them the payment. When they later wanted to send that payment, any of them could then create a distribution transaction containing the committed outputs. And unlike the example from a previous subsection, they do not need to pre-sign anything. So they would never need to interact with each other. Even better, the information Alice needs to send them in order to allow them to verify the setup transaction and ultimately spend their money could be sent through existing asynchronous communication methods, such as email or a cloud driver. That means, the receiver would not need to be online at the time Alice created and sent her setup transaction. This elimination of the need to interact is a particular highlight of this proposal. If we imagine the example above with Alice being an exchange, the interactive form of the protocol would require her to keep the 10 participants online and connected to her service from the moment each of them submitted their withdrawal request until the interaction was done and they all need to use wallets compatible with such a child transaction signing protocol. The non-interactive form with check outputs script hash verify would only require them to submit a Bitcoin address and an email address or some other protocol address for delivery of the commitment outputs. Feedback and activation. The proposal received over 30 replies on the Bitcoin dev mailing list as of this writing. The concerns raised included, not flexible enough. Matt Carollo says that we need to have a flexible solution that provides more features than just this, or we risk adding it only to go through all the effort again when people ask for a better solution. It is not generic enough, says Russell O'Connor suggests both check output script hash verify and sick hash any previous output described in last week's newsletter could be replaced with using opcat 
opcode and the object sig from stack opcode. Both opcodes are currently implemented in the elements project sidechains, such as liquid. The opcat opcode catenates two strings into the string and the object sig from stack opcode compares a signature on the stack to other data on the stack rather than to the transaction that contains the signature. Catenation allows a script to include various parts of a message that are combined with witness elements at spending time in order to form a complete message that can be verified using object sig from stack. Because the message that gets verified can be a Bitcoin transaction, including a potential copy of the transaction the spender is attempting to send, these operations allow a script to evaluate transactions data without having to directly read the transaction being evaluated. Compare this to check output, to check output script hash verify, which looks at the hash of the output and any brief output, with, which looks at all the other signatures in the transaction. A potentially major downside of the CAD check stick from SAC approach is that it requires larger witnesses to hold the transaction script and all of its witness elements. O'Connor notes that he does not mind switching to more concise implementations like check output script hash verify and any prevout. Once it's clear, a significant number of users are making use of those functions via a generic templates. Not safe enough. Johnson Lau points out that COSHV allows signature replay similar to BIP 118, no input. A, perce a perceived risk that BIP any grief out takes pain to eliminate. Ruben and other providers uh, at least permanently respond a preliminary response to each of these comments concerns. We expect discussion to be ongoing. So we'll report back with any significant developments in the future weeks. The proposed BIP for check output script hash verify suggests it could be activated along with BIP taproot if users desire it. A BIP taproot is itself still under discussion. We don't recommend anyone come to actually dual activation. Future discussion and implementation testing will reveal whether each proposal is mature enough, desirable enough, and enough support by users to warrant being added to Bitcoin. Overall, check output script hash verify appears to provide a simple but clever method for allowing outputs to commit to where, where their funds can ultimately be sent. In next week's newsletter, we'll look at some other ways check output script hash verify could be used to improve efficiency, privacy, or both. BEC32 sending support. Week 11 of 24 in a series about allowing the people you pay to access all of SegWit's multiple benefits. Last week, we described one of the costs of not upgrading to BAC32 sending support. Users might think that your service is out of date and so look for alternative services. This week, we'll look at the strong, uh, stronger form of that argument. Wallets which already can only receive to BAC32 addresses. If the users of these wallets want to receive a payment or make a withdrawal from your service and you do not yet support sending to BAC32 addresses, they'll either have to use a second wallet or have to use one of your competitors. Wasabi Wallet, known for its privacy-enhancing coin join mode and mandatory user coin control, only accepts payments to BAC32 addresses. This relatively new wallet was designed around compact block filters, similar to those described in BIP 158. However, since all of these filters are served by Wasabi's infrastructure, the decision was made to minimize filter size by only including pay-to-witness public key hash outputs and spends in the filter. This means the wallet cannot see payments to other output types, including pay to script hash and pay to script hash wrapped SegWit addresses. Trust Wallet is a fairly new proprietary wallet owned by the Binance Cryptocurrency Exchange and compatible with Android and iOS. As a new wallet, they did not need to implement legacy address receiving support, so they only implemented SegWit. They made BAC32 the only support way to send Bitcoin to this wallet. Electrum is popular wallet for 
desktop and mobile. And when creating a new wallet seed, you can choose between legacy wallet and SegWit wallet. With SegWit being the current default, users choosing a SegWit wallet seed will only be able to generate back 32 addresses for receiving. Electrum warns users about the compatibility issues this may create with software and services that have not upgraded to back 32, back 32 sending support yet. Please note that it's neither required nor recommended for wallets authors to create a new seed in order to support a new address format. Other wallets, such as Bitcoin Core version 0.16 and above, can produce the legacy pay to script hash segwit and back 32 addresses all from the same seed. The user just needs to specify which address type they want if they don't want the default. As time goes on, we expect more new wallets to only implement receiving to the current best address format. Today, that's version zero with SegWit addresses for pay to witness public key hash and pay to witness script hash using BAC32. But if Taproot is adopted, it will use version one SegWit addresses that will also use BAC32. The longer your service delays implementing BAC32 sending support, the more chance you'll have of losing customers because they cannot request payments from you using their preferred wallet. Correction to newsletter 46. Our section about BAC32 QR codes incorrectly claimed that BAC32 addresses used in BIP21 URIs with an additional parameter could not use the QR uppercase alphanumerical mode. Nadav Ifki kindly informed us that a QR code could mix modes. We've updated that paragraph with the correct information and some additional details and an additional set of QR code examples. If you notice any error in an Optech newsletter or any of our documentation, please send us an email, tweet, or otherwise contact one of our contributors. Selected question and answers from the Bitcoin Stack Exchange. One of the first places Bitcoin Optech contributors look for answers to their questions, or when we have a few spare moments of time to help curious or confused users. In this monthly feature, we highlight some of the top voted questions and answers made since our last update. First, what are the limitations for amortizing the interactive session setup of Music? Richard Myers is attempting to optimize interactive setup for a low bandwidth system, but user Nickler emphasizes that nonces must not be reused or private keys could be leaked. Nickler goes on to provide suggestions to achieve Myers' goal. And here we have the question. Why are the limitations of amortizing the interactive session setup of music? The question by Richard Myers. I'm trying to amortize the interactive session setup of the Moosic Signature Aggregation Scheme. My motivation is to use signature aggregation between devices communicating using low bandwidth radio channels without having to do the session setup multiple times. Ideally, pre-shared public nonces could be reused for different signer sets, public keys, and messages. I've summarized below how I understand it would works, it works now, mostly from looking at the code example here, linking to the elements project. Each peer creates a per session secret key from the hash of the set of signers public key and the secret key for the peer's public key, independent of the nonce. Then each peer creates a secret nonce from the signers public key and others and other hash information, including a random number. Then each peer creates a public nonce generated like a public key from the secret nonce. Then all peers send to all other peers a 32-byte nonce commitment. And all peers send to all other peers their 32-byte public nonce and verify the others against their previous shared nonce commitment. The key point seems to be that the public nonce should not be freely chosen by anyone after learning the public nonce of the other signing. Each peer can now sign using their session secret key and secret nonce. Other peers can verify the final or partial multi-signature using the other signer's chosen public key and their corresponding public nonces. 
What I wonder is if the public knots can be committed to once in advance by all peers and then reused for different combinations of public keys. Are the peers public key messages? And it seems like peers could cage each other as public nonces and reuse them for different signing sessions with different public keys. And other signers, as long as the signers were compelled to use the same public norms every time they signed. Any pointers on the restrictions for reusing these music public nonces would be appreciated. And here we have the answer by the great team of Jonas Nick and Peter Woolley. Nonces must not be reused. In particular, in music, nonces cannot be reused for other combinations of public keys or messages. Also, if everyone uses the same public nonce all the time, this would leak private keys. Your pre-share fresh nonces by running multiple signing rounds in parallel with the library you pick to, SACP-256K1-CKP. This is secure as, you long, as long as you keep the session states in memory and do not copy it. Serialization, the state, and storing it on a persistent medium is not supported by SACP-256K1-CKP and difficult to get right because if you accidentally use the wrong nonce, you leak the private key. A straightforward way to eliminate the overhead of the first two interaction rounds is by attaching the nonce commitment and the nonce to already existing messages in your protocol. That way you would only have two parallel signing sessions. There is research being done to deterministic nonce for music, which have zero knowledge proofs that nonce is derived correctly. With such proofs, nonces can be derived on demand from the signer set, your private key and the message, and there is no state to keep track of. Fantastic. Thank you very much for these answers. Continuing. On-chain costs of SegWit version 1 versus SegWit version 0. User WebAG asks for a comparison of transaction weight between SegWit version 0 and version 1, specifically for relatively simple single key transactions. Andrew Chow provides byte level details and concludes that version 1 is always cheaper to spend, while version 0 can be cheaper to create an output. However, Andrew points out that the sender generally does not have much choice in choosing which output they send to. So users are likely to prefer version 1, even for single key transactions. WAPEG also provides an answer that shows a summary table. Into the question, asked by WAPEG and edited by Merge. How do total blockchain <coughs> time chain costs for SegWit version 0 compare to version 1, which is being produced, proposed? I'm specifically interested in a single user transaction both paying to a public key or public key hash and script, most asking about scripts without branching, as I understand there are savings in more complex scripts with more branches. By total blockchain cost, I mean the number of bytes, V bytes and weight in both the output as well as the input that are spending these outputs. In other words, I'm asking if there will be any savings in version one script compared to the transaction that can be done on version zero. And here we have the answer by Andrew Chow. In general, SegWit version 1 is cheaper than SegWit version 2 to spend, but slightly more expensive to create. SegWit version 1 output scripts are defined by the proposed taproot BIP will always be 35 bytes in length. However, SegWit version 0 output scripts are either 22 bytes for the single key case or 34 bytes script hash case. This means that the person sending to SegWit version 1 will end up paying a little bit more than for a SegWit version 0 output. Of course, the recipient can use pay to script hash red SegWit outputs, so that cost would actually be pushed to them. However, SegWit version 1 is cheaper for the recipient than he wants to spend that output, because SegWit version 1 is a pay to pubkey model. The public key does not need to be specified in the input. This saves 34 bytes of witness data, 34 weight units, 8.5 virtual bytes. Additionally, SegWit version 0 uses ECDSA signatures, which are encoded using the DER encoding. This results in signatures that are typically 71 or 72 bytes, 
Each size has 50% probability of occurring for any signature unless the software specifically only creates 71 byte signatures like Bitcoin Core does. But SegWit version 1 uses Schnorr signatures and the encoding specified for that in the BIPs, which will typically be 64 bytes in length, can be 65 if someone uses a stick hash all, is used but what is rare. For simplicity, we can say that this is a reduction of 8 bytes, which is 8 weight units and 2 virtual bytes. So for the typical single key case, SegWit version 1 saves 42 bytes, which is 42 weight units or 10.5 virtual bytes. Where it gets interesting is the case of multisigs, the most common type of script used. For multisig, the MUSIG multi-signature scheme. MUSIG allows a N of N multisig or a M of N non-accountable multisig. That is, no one will be able to know who signed. Appear to observe as in single key signatures, this means that there is only one public key specified in the output and one signature verified in the input. So for all the N of N multi six and non-accountable M of N multi six, this cost is exactly the same as for the single case, single key case. But the savings vary depending on the number of signers. The savings for the first signers are the same as at the single case, single key case. For every additional signer, for example, when N is larger one, using SegWit version one saves 107 bytes which is 107 weight units or 26.75 virtual bytes. It gets more complicated for M of N signatures where you want accountability. Such threshold signatures can be achieved by using MUSIC and a Merkle tree that represents every combination of signing keys. However, the size using SegFit version one will be ultimately be smaller than SegFit version 0 because ultimately the leaves of the Merkle tree will always be single pub keys and the hashes in between will be slightly smaller than public keys in a traditional script. Lastly, the most common of the thresholds can be used as root cases in the taproot, which allows for more savings as the branch of the script does not need to be revealed. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this great answer. Does version 1 SegWit include version 0? Peter Woolley states that no, you cannot use version 0 scripts inside a version 1 spend. He elaborates that the reason behind this is in order to meet some of the goals behind version 1 leads to incompatibility with aspects of version 2 script. This is a question asked again by Webpack. My question is whether the version 1 of SegWit the version one of SegWit will allow you to use version zero script types inside of it. In other words, is version one support a superset of version zero? Please include reasoning behind the design decision. If this question is about the recent published BIP Tapro proposal, the answer is no. You cannot use a version zero script inside a version one output. The general reason for this is that some of the goals the BIP is trying to achieve are incompatible with version 0 scripts. That one itself does not make it impossible to support version 0 scripts. But reasonings about the benefit of the change is much easier if you know there is no way to bypass them. Furthermore, the changes between the initial set of supported features in version 1 and version 0 is small. No check multisig. The op check multisig opcode is unnecessarily inefficient, as it sometimes needs to try multiple combinations of public keys with signatures. Furthermore, it is not compatible with batch validation, the ability to verify all signatures in a block faster than verifying them individually. As multisig constructions are very useful, a replacement opcode is available. Op check sig at which increments a counter based on whether or not a signature check succeeded. Schnorr instead of ECDSA. All opcodes that take ECDSA signatures in version 0 are changed to take Schnorr signatures instead. They are more efficient, but also ECDSA does not support batch validation, conflicting with one of BIP Taproot's design goals. And improved sick hashing. Some improvements are made to the hash that's signed in signatures to resolve a few long-standing issues.
If there was a way to bypass these improvements, it would be hard for other participants in a transaction to rely on these fixes being guaranteed. Thank you, Peter Woolley, for this great answer. And the last question for today, fee negotiations in Lightning Network. Mark H. describes how, in an example, for hop Lightning Network payment, fees are negotiated. This is a question by Sergei Tikhomirov. How are fees negotiated in multi-hop payments in Lightning? Imagine a four-hop payment, Alice, Bob, Charlie, Dave. Bob and Charlie advertise fees of 100 Satoshis each. Alice thinks it's reasonable and starts routing the payment through this route. Does Bob know which part of the expected payment is intended to be the fee? What is Bob's forward, the payment to Charlie, taking 120, 150, or 200 sets instead of 100? What does Charlie do? Is there anything that prevents intermediary nodes from lying about their fees? And here we have the answer of Mark H. Nodes advertise the fee for forwarding over the channels as part of a channel update message. The update should be sent as soon as a channel announcement is sent. Each party can decide its own fees for the channel. For private channels, nodes advertise the fee inside the tagged field of the bold 11 invoice. When forwarding a payment, your node must calculate the required fee for each hop and add it to the payment request in the invoice. When each intermediate hop receives an update at HTLC message, they will wrap onto the one level of the Onion package, which contains an amount to forward. This is subtracted from the amount mthat in the update at HTLC message, and the difference is the fee paid for this hop. In the hop, if the hop determines that the fee is insufficient, they respond to the sender with fee insufficient error as part of the update fail HTLC message. This message also includes the most recent channel update for this channel so that the payer can re-attempt the payment with new fees. This is always the possibility of a race condition where fees may have been changed between the most recently received channel update and the payment attempt. This is minimized by including the channel update as part of the failure as above. If the payment at the last hop is too small, they will respond with a failure containing the incorrect or unknown payment details failure code. Thank you very much, Mark, for this good answer. Back into the newsletter for the notable code and documentation changes. This week in Bitcoin Core, LND, C Lightning, Eclair, Lipsec P256K1, and the Bitcoin improvement proposals. This LND change increases the maximum number of blocks the daemon will wait for confirmation of a channel funding transaction, initialized by a remote peer, raising it from 288 blocks, two days, to 2016 blocks, two weeks. This allows patient users to pay lower transaction fees. This C Lightning change specified a default plugin directory from which big plugins will be automatically loaded even if the plugin or plugin dir configuration parameter are not specified. Currently, this is the plugins directory in the Lightning Daemon configuration directory. This C Lightning change adds a new plugin hook for when a remote peer tries to open a channel with the local node. This allows the plugin to reject the channel open to perform other actions before the channel is opened. And this eclair change adds a send to route method that allows the user to manually select the channel through which a payment is initially routed. This can allow them to choose which channel gets drained of funds. This eclair change allows users to specify the pre-image when creating an invoice. This can be used for systems that securely generate unguessable invoice identifiers, such as an atomic swap or a set of contract terms combined with a nonce in pay-to-contract format. Peers, oh, new publication schedule. Start, starting this week, the Optech newsletter will be published every Wednesday instead of every Tuesday. This will give us an extra weekday to review and edit newsletter drafts before we publish. Special thanks. We thank Jeremy Rubin and Anthony Towns for their reviews of the draft of this newsletter, including describing to us the tree of output ideas. We additionally thank Peter Woolley for helping us better understand where interaction is required in aggregating keys and signers with music. 
Any errors in the published version of this newsletter are the fault of the author. Peers, you have to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter. And again, thank you very much to the founding sponsors, principals, and associates of this great open source organization. If you like this reading, support the TallyCoin and reach out at towardsliberty.com contact. Thank you very much and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.